What's going on guys? Welcome to this week's video. I have one of my little male T-positive 007s here with me for the moment for the introduction here. Um, I do have a pair of these available if anybody's looking, but um, including him himself. So anyhow, uh, what I wanted to discuss this week is basically uh, snakes in general with, with defecation, but we're going to focus primarily on these larger heavy heavy body terrestrial species with the bloods and short tails. So what I want to do is discuss a little bit of, you know, why these animals evolved this way, what that has to do with what's going on, discuss a little bit of laboratory research on the subject, and the lack really of any understanding of what they're doing in the wild. And I think that's probably the most difficult part is that we don't have the wild data to compare with the data that we have from, from captive populations. And so we have to fill in the blanks a little bit. So let's dive in, let's discuss it, and we'll see you shortly. So as I said, we're gonna get into discussing different types of snakes, how they've evolved into their niche, and how that directly relates to their storage or lack thereof of, of feces. And so I think the first thing to really look at is the difference between say your arboreal snakes versus your terrestrial snakes. So it's very easy to look at the body structure of those animals and we see that most arboreal species are typically more slender, they're lighter, um, the way that they're built is going to facilitate a life climbing up into the trees and up into branches and things that you know may not be designed to hold a lot of weight and so they have to be able to do that and to move you know, pretty pretty nimble uh, up, up there in the canopy and in those branches or wherever their niche is, whether it's lower hanging or up higher. And so they've evolved to, to do that. Whereas these terrestrial snakes are much thicker, more heavy bodied, uh, and there's reasoning behind some of this stuff. So that's why a lot of them are more ambush predators. It's not as easy for them to move all that mass around and go out and be an active hunter. Um, you know, you, you see that much more in the active hunters where they are more slender, they have less mass to carry around. Uh, it facilitates that lifestyle because when you have to move your mass, um, just like you know, if, if you get a little heavier or you lose a bunch of weight, there's a big difference in how much energy it takes to move that mass around. So if you're a larger mass, a more sedentary lifestyle is easier. And so we see that with the bloods and short tails, where naturally we know, be it wild or captivity, that they're a fairly sedentary species. They're not out actively looking for food, they're waiting for food to come to them. Uh, we see it even in some of the rattlesnake species. Uh, and it's very interesting with rattlesnakes, on a little bit of a side note, uh, that some of the more communal species will actually go to areas to sit and wait and ambush prey where other uh, familiar snakes have gone and had success. So I don't know how that communication works or how they are aware of that, but just an interesting aside that I found in reading some of these papers, um, which I also found that those same snakes prefer to spend time around closely related family members than they do around the other snakes within that community. So that was pretty interesting too. Getting off the subject though. So these terrestrial snakes have a tremendous amount of mass. Uh, gaboon vipers, your rhino vipers, your bloods, your short tails, even your Burmese pythons, your rock pythons, these larger species are known as ambush predators, sitting weight. Now obviously gaboon vipers, rhino vipers have adapted venom, whereas you know these other, these other uh, snakes are constrictor snakes. And so they each adapted their own way to kill prey, but their body is still suited to what they're doing. Now, as we're discussing that, and we're, we want to dive into why these animals are retaining feces for such a, a long amount of time, uh, you will see people talk about, I have this blood or I have this short tail, they haven't gone to the bathroom in three months, six months, eight months, a year, over a year. So labs have found the same thing in studies. They found these arboreal species that typically after a meal, within like three to seven days, they're eliminating whatever they've taken in, they're getting it out of their system um, because they wanna be able to go back to being nimble again and being able to move within their niche. If they kept retaining that food and getting heavier and heavier, it's gonna be a lot harder for them to climb, it's a lot more mass to move, it's gonna take more energy. 
So it makes sense for them to eliminate that more frequently. So now you might say, well, what is the advantage to a blood or a short tail python to retaining these feces for such long periods of time? Now, one thing that a lot of this is all just theories, because even after this lab research, they've substantiated that this happens, but the reasoning for it is largely speculative outside of some of the things that we know. So one thing we know is that when a snake eats prey, they're digesting the prey from the outside in. And a lot of the nutrients that they are after are inside. And so they need to digest as much of that as possible. And they want to do that fairly rapidly, which is why their digestive system is, is so kind of a crazy system. But they're able to extract nutrients for a decent period of time. Uh, and it's thought to take weeks sometimes and maybe even upwards of a month for them to extract everything out of the meal in these slower metabolism animals. So one of the reasons that they suspect that they would hold on to it for a little while is to absorb maximum amounts of nutrients and maximum amount of moisture out of that prey item. Now, there's only a theory that that would take upwards of weeks or a month. There's nothing to prove that it can be longer, it can be shorter. They haven't been able to quantify that really down to, you know, a fine line. So the thought is after that period of time, there's really not so much nutritional value to that, which begs the question, why? So for the answer that they've come up with or the theory that they're working on, uh, you have to look at the structure of these animals. So when you look at a blood or a short tail python, and let's grab one so we can, we can look at this as we're talking. Um, apologies for that, I was a little indecisive on which animal I wanted to select. So I figure I'll get somebody that's really relaxed here. So when we look at the structure of these animals, you notice their, their neck and the, the front end of their body here is fairly slender compared to the lower, the lower end here. Uh, and right now he's pretty empty, so there's not much built up in here. So he's actually about as slender as he gets, but he's still thicker back there than he is his neck. And part of the reasoning that they suppose this is for is these animals are designed to take down some decent sized prey items. And so as an ambush predator, they're gonna sit and wait for these prey items to come along. And when they do, they need to be able to strike quickly and maintain control of that animal. And so oftentimes these animals are, are fairly decent sized and compared to the body of the snake. So one thing that having their weight concentrated towards the back does is it allows them to anchor themselves while throwing the lighter portion of their body very quickly. And anybody that's kept blood in short tail python knows these guys can strike very, very rapidly. Uh, gaboon, gaboon vipers have one of the fastest strikes, if not the fastest strike in snakes, even though they're very heavy bodied, same idea. So that front half of their body is really spring loaded. And these guys can launch themselves entirely, uh, but but that front half is really designed to be athletic and quickly, and that back half is designed to anchor them. So when you understand that that's something that they're trying to do, then that's where it starts to make sense that they're gonna retain feces. And so uh, what they actually think these animals are doing is basically creating a ballast for themselves. So they're creating a heavier anchor. And they found in these scientific studies that these animals were retaining five to 20% of their body weight and it's all pushed down to that lower end. That's where they're storing all those feces is down, down in here. You know, and as time goes on, it might build further and further up. And then at a certain point, they're going to evacuate and start over. Um, now, they, they believe that what these animals are doing is basically adding to their mass in their back end to further anchor themselves uh, and keeping that front clear to keep that speed. So by anchoring themselves, they get better friction on the ground, better hold. So as they're striking, they're holding their position. If that animal they're trying to overtake is struggling, it's that much more weight countering that animal struggling. So now you don't have the prey item dragging your entire body off with them. You're able to control them better. Uh, and the reason for this, because you might say, well, if they need more mass, why not just add more mass to their body and get bigger? Well, that's a nice idea, but the more mass you have, the more energy it requires to maintain it. So what this does by storing feces back there is allows them to add to their, mat, their mass without the metabolic uh, need to, um, what's the word I'm looking for here? Uh, the, the metabolic maintenance. So they don't need to maintain that body weight. If they, if they have more weight back here, 
they've got to maintain that. They got to take in those calories, that energy that it takes to maintain that muscle or maintain that fat, whatever it is. When it's just stored poop, it's no cost to the animals, no maintenance. They can sit there as long as they want and they have that available to them without utilizing nutrients that they need for the rest of their body. Uh, so it's actually quite brilliant and I think it's a really intelligent theory into why these animals may be doing that. Uh, it makes total sense to me. Uh, the science seems to back it on the laboratory research. Uh, and the longest they found in their study that a snake went without going to the bathroom was 420 days. Uh, and I believe that was a gaboon viper. Um, but 420 days is a long time. Um, and they had another gaboon that went, I believe, 354 days. They had a python curtis, a Sumatran short tail, presumably. Uh, given when the study was done, Curtis kind of covered a little bit more, but they specifically said Curtis and not Curtis Bronger's Meyer, Curtis um, Breitenstein. So I'm assuming it was a Sumatran short tail python, uh, and that one went 386 days. So it's not unheard of, and the lab was trying to use some different situations to see if what they were doing could affect how often the animals were going to the bathroom. And so with one gaboon viper in particular, they were taking it out for regular exercise, encouraging it to move more. Um, they were feeding them larger meals, smaller meals, wasn't affecting when they were going to the bathroom. Uh, and they found the same thing in the arboreal animals, larger, small meals didn't matter. They were still defecating in the same amount of time. Uh, and what it seemed to them is the only thing that you could do to affect when they were going to the bathroom was increase the feeding and uh, it was cutting down the frequency. It was almost like there's a predetermined point where the animals want to reset. So once they get to maybe, you know, depending on the animal, maybe it's 12% of their body weight, maybe it's 15, maybe it's 20. When they get to that percentage, they chuck it and start over. And so it didn't matter. The, the, the animals would, would wait until they got that percentage, whatever it was. So you could ramp it up to get them to go every month and a half or two months or all the way to a year within the same animal just based on not meal size but that percentage of body weight that's now stored in feces and so i thought that was really interesting now i had some theories on this and after reading all this science i'm not sure where those really fit in because i don't typically have problems with my animals retaining uh, i love how he just fucking chills he's great but uh my animals go fairly regularly then again i don't keep records but it's been maybe once or twice in keeping that I remember one going so long where I was like, okay, this is starting to worry me a little bit. What's going on? And I was really thinking about it. Uh, normally they get a little fatter. They get a little thinner when they go. And I, I don't think much of it. Uh, I clean them when they're dirty. Don't clean them if they're not. Uh, not a lot of complication there. But, uh, you know, I had a feeling because I vary the frequency of feeding and because uh, I do so much like that. I do take my animals out frequently, things like that. I figured that they were maybe just going more regularly because of that. But according to this, it doesn't seem like uh, that's going to affect it as much as they just get to that point, whatever it is, and, and let it fly. Uh, now, obviously, there can be points where animals become impacted. So generally speaking, I tell people when they get to that point of concern, you know, you can go back to the tail here and you can kind of palpate and feel like he has a little urate in there, uh, very, very small, something he'll probably pass eventually, but nothing that's that's blocking it. It's not sitting in a way where you don't think the animal's gonna be able to naturally work it out. He's like, what are you doing to my tail, dude? And that's why I wanted to use him for this because uh, you know he'll let me manipulate this without, without getting upset about it. He's paying attention, but he's not bothered. Uh, so if you don't feel anything like that, that feels stuck back there, and the animal appears healthy and they're doing things normally, like eating normally, drinking normally, their behavior is normal. There's really no reason for concern. If you do think something's stuck, then, you know, a lot of times getting them to swim around or, or some handling to jostle it, you can massage it lightly, but you've always got to be careful. So you're, you're massaging and you're going to, you know, manipulate their body a little bit, but you got to keep in mind that they have their, their bone structure all the way down and everything like that. So you don't want to hurt anything, do any damage. So, you know, you're just lightly kind of manipulating, not forcing. Um, and a lot of times they'll even figure out what's going on and start trying to help themselves with the process. Depends on the animal, your relationship with them, their level of comfort. Obviously he's super comfortable with everything I'm doing right now. 
as you can see, he's not really even trying to get away. He's not pulling his tail away, nothing. He's just chilling here, letting me do my thing. Uh, it's very much his personality, the relationship that we have. Uh, if I had some other snakes out here and tried to do that, they would not tolerate that. Um, I gotta watch out, I start massaging too much and he'll force it out and go to the bathroom on me. But yeah, so this, this uh, adaptive ballast theory, I think probably has the most weight of everything that I looked through, where, you know, these animals are basically utilizing the feces to make themselves a better streamlined predator. And so, you know, there's no reason to let this feces go constantly because it's a resource for them. And I'd love to see some more studies into it, especially in wild populations and see how wild populations are utilizing that. Uh, that would be really, really interesting, but we don't really have such data. Um, but I think as far as theories go, the logic is very sound. The science appears to be sound. Everything about it to me makes sense to where I would get on board uh, with that theory. Um, you know, it's a lot easier to take down a larger meal when you've got that weight behind you and it. it's a lot easier to anchor it, to anchor yourself. And uh, like I said, that, that wouldn't make sense for an arboreal snake because that would be counterproductive to the lifestyle it's living but it makes a lot of sense for these guys. And since it's found in so many of these larger terrestrial species, the period of time is, is always longer. There has to be some reason for it, and I think it's sound. Uh, so I would love to hear some things that you guys have as far as input goes on this. But typically, I think newer keepers worry too much about how often they're going. Um, you know, I, I think... Like I said, you just pay attention. You look for when there's signs that there might be an issue. Um, look for behavioral changes, things like that. But, uh, um, you know, by and large, I haven't had many problems. I had one snake really ever that I ever had an issue with uh, that used to retain quite a bit. And she would get very, very large urates built up. Um, and on occasion, you would swim her. And so people say to soak them, and soaking does help. But if you're going to soak and you're doing it for the purpose of loosening that stuff up, it's a lot better if you put them in a situation where they kind of have to swim around. If they're just sitting in a little bit of water, that's not really gonna do much. That movement within the water is really what helps the muscles move around, shift some things, and then things will often come out. Uh, so any questions, let me know. Uh, and hopefully you guys enjoyed learning a little bit about this. Uh, there's a lot of great studies out there. So if you hit the Google machine and kind of look up, you know, blood python or short tail python or even snakes in general and look up, you know, snakes holding their, their feces. Uh, there's some interesting reads out there and uh, hopefully in the future we'll learn a lot more about the wild populations. But I think for now it's, it's important to understand that it is normal for these animals to hold it for a longer period of time than a lot of other species that people might be used to with your colubrid species, with your active hunters, with your arboreal and semi-arboreal species. You know, if I had an olive python that was holding it like a short tail, I'd be more concerned because they go to the bathroom more frequently. Uh, they are a species that can be semi-arboreal. Uh, same with my Michalots pythons, I would be very concerned. Um, but these guys, you know, as long as, as long as this is all clear back here and there's nothing big and hard blocking it and sitting in a position where you go, eh, probably not too safe, you should be good to go. Uh, we'll see you guys soon. Thank you.